So the 11 by 17 map you'll want to keep out and handy because you'll want to reference that through the evening here tonight. So we're looking at the Tower of Babel. And that'll conclude our beginnings era. And next week we will shift into the patriarch era and we're going to blitz through the rest of the book of Genesis in two weeks. And that will feel like it goes by really quick. So, Tower of Babel. It's a relatively short story that has profound impacts throughout the course of the world today. It's really simple. As God commanded Noah and his sons to fill the earth, they didn't. They rebelled and they settled on the plain of Shinar. And so then God confuses their languages and they end up scattering. <clears throat> and one of the cool things about this history or period of history in the world is that geography is not nearly as fixed as we think of it today. The map was constantly changing. I illustrate that here with a series of maps, one of which is even a video that will work for me in here. But this is how we know the Middle East today. This doesn't show all the political boundaries, and the green is not indicative of vegetation. That is just lower elevations, but you've got your bodies of water, in the upper left, you've got the Mediterranean Sea. Lower left is the Red Sea. In the center, you've got the Persian Gulf. And two rivers flowing into it are the Tigris and the Euphrates. The catch is, is that right after the flood, presumably there weren't any polar ice caps formed yet because the flood waters would have been relatively warm, which means the sea level, once the water had all drained off of the earth, would have been about 220 feet higher than it is today. So that would look like this. And most of Iraq is underwater actually, including Baghdad. But the more significant one for us in this point, uh, lecture is that the uh, current location of Babylon was underwater. So Babel and Babylon are not necessarily the exact same location because while the sea levels were fluctuating pretty wildly for a few hundred years here, at least immediately after the flood, um, the location of Babylon was underwater. Um, somewhere in here is where the ark came down in the center. It says the mountains of Ararat, so it's not likely actually Mount Ararat. And what is Mount Ararat today is actually a post-flood volcano. And so that mountain probably didn't actually exist when the ark landed on dry ground but the, it's definitely the area somewhere up in northern Iraq, eastern, or no, western Iran, southern Turkey, and that also happens to be where Sumerian civilization formed. <coughs> but sea level then shifts quite dramatically over the next few hundred years so that by the time people are starting to move, oh, can we, okay, can you go back and see if you can get that to play? Yeah, sea levels drop about 630 feet, which allows human migration quite dramatically. Can you pause there for just a moment, Makai? And get rid of that thing on the bottom. You have to move on to the screen. Yeah. Anyhow, so, yeah, you can go ahead and pause there. Notice how they're, ah, there you go. <laughs> no, it also hit the space bar. Yep. So there is no Persian Gulf at the peak of the Ice Age because the Persian Gulf would have all been above water. And at the base of the Red Sea, you can see that Africa is actually connected to Yemen. Now you could use that mouse and hit the X in the lower right. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Africa is a little bit bigger, but otherwise it looks mostly the same. It's connected to Spain. Yes, Spain connects there at the end of the Mediterranean. And so the 
Mediterranean Sea is landlocked. Yeah, the Mediterranean Sea is landlocked. The Adriatic Sea is largely non-existent, except for that little bit by the boot. The Black Sea is much, much lower. All right, keep going, Makai. Notice Great Britain is landlocked because the North Sea didn't exist and the English Channel didn't exist. Iceland is huge. Yes, Iceland is huge. This is... Yeah, that's all underwater now. Keep going. Yep. Moving over to our side of the planet. Oh. The East Coast is much bigger. Florida almost connects to the Bahamas and Cuba. Yep, Florida's <laughs> chunky. The Gulf of Mexico is much smaller. Okay. It's like a nose. Hudson Florida Bay was, was under two miles of ice. <laughs> Keep going. And in the upper left, you'll see that Asia is connected to Alaska. The Bering Strait does not exist right there. Very good. Thank you, Makai. So that visually illustrates now we need to get to the next slide if we can. What's going on and facilitates a human migration pattern after the Tower of Babel. You've been learning about this, yes. So the human migration is fascinating because you can study it in multiple different ways that independently verify and support each other. One of them is through the human Y chromosome because fathers pass their Y chromosome onto their sons without any modification from the mothers. And mothers in the same way will pass on their mitochondrial DNA uh, precisely without it, the father having any impact on that. And those end up being genetic markers by which you can trace human migration patterns. And another one that is independent of all genetics is human languages, which also trace human migration. And all three of those lead back into the Middle East. Now this one has an assumption. There's the assumption that all humanity came out of Africa, and so they have the lines coming out of Kenya down there. But you'll notice that going from Kenya, you go straight up to the Middle East, and then it scatters out from every other location. So that could just be a single stretch of the human migration that was reversed, and then you have it coming out of the Middle East, right where the Tower of Babel is and people move from there into Europe, into Asia, down into Africa, and then into the Americas. And actually human migration did not finish settling and populating the entire earth until the Vikings and the Inuits made it to Greenland in about 1200 AD. And so it took actually quite a long time. That was about the same time Pacific Islanders made it over to Easter Island, otherwise known as Rapa Nui. And uh, by this point in time you have lots of settlements and empires in other places. One thing that I realized when I was reading a book uh, about this migration is that post-flood you have two different types of uh, civilizations that can move around the earth to go ahead and fill it. There was a new form of lifestyle that was not available pre-flood that was available post-flood and that is the hunter-gatherer society because people were able to kill and eat they could actually just go hunting and eat. Whereas before the flood, to righteously eat, you had to farm it. So this creates two very different speeds of being able to migrate away from Babel. If you're a hunter-gatherer, you can go wherever you can find an animal to hunt and kill and you can eat, and you're not tied down for a growing season by a field, which means that you can move for 12 months out of the year instead of just a handful of months out of the year. So that's one of the reasons why archaeology today finds hunter-gatherer societies evenly distributed throughout the whole earth by what they mark as the year 12,000 BC, which would be just slightly after Babel, closer to 2000 or 2100 BC probably, because people were able to spread out quite quickly if they were employing the hunter-gatherer strategy. But if they were a farming civilization like the Sumerians were, then things go much slower. One thing you'll notice is that farming civilizations start in river valleys simultaneously and almost independently of each other as far as archaeology is concerned. In the Nile River Valley, the Indus River Valley, 
and the Chinese river valleys of the Yangtze's and the Yellow River. And all of those are connected by waterways to the Middle East with a little migration over land necessary. And um, so that would be where farmers quickly made it to post Babel and then started their agricultural expansion across the rest of the world. All right, so then we get into the table of nations. And I've got some handouts for this. Summarizing all of that. And one of those back to Jeremy. And this is where the map that I handed out on the 11 by 17 will come in handy because the names on that map are color coded. JFAT is in green. So these names end up having some impact on geography's names and they are associated with people groups that we find throughout the rest of the Old Testament. So, going starting with the descendants of Japheth, you have Gomer, and Gomer is later recorded as the Sumerians, and that is in the northern part of the Black Sea. Is Gomer on that map? I don't think so. All right, so Gomer made it further north than the map shows. The Kerch Straits is what we know it, it today, where the Sea of Azov meets the Black Sea. That's where the Russians built a couple bridges over the Kerch Straits. That is the central area of the Sumerian Bosporus Kingdom, where the descendants of Gomer ended up settling. And they adopted Greek culture, actually, later. Madai, this is one that comes up regularly throughout the rest of the Old Testament. It's the forefather of the Medes and they settled on the south side of the Caspian Sea in the mountains there, northern part of Iran. They were distinctly different people group from the Persians, but they were allied with the Persians later, and the two of them formed an empire together. Javan is one that is known for being the forefather of the Greeks, or the Ionians. A J and an I ended up, or were the same letter in the Latin alphabet way back in the day. <coughs> so there is a linguistic connection there. But the maritime peoples are the ones that settled in the Aegean Sea. They're descended from Javan. Elisha is the name for Cyprus later on in the Old Testament. And so it's his descendants that settled in Cyprus. And the Rodanim settled in Rhodes. The Ashkenaz is thought to be the Scythians. Potentially, they were a nomadic people in the Ukrainian area and the steppes of Russia, southern Russia. And some people trace them as to having moved from there and migrated into Scotland, potentially. That is not fully verified, perhaps, but that is a potential linguistic connection there. The descendants of Japheth end up settling just about everywhere in the world except for Africa and the Middle East. So they cover Europe, they cover Asia, they get to the Americas. If they're Chinese, they're descended from Japheth most likely. There's a few question marks in a few other places, but uh, genetics and linguistics generally support that. Moving on to the descendants of Ham. I don't know how, but for some reason, all four of them ended up heading the same general direction. Kush is associated with Ethiopia, which is the highlands south of the region of the Nile River. And I think Kush ends up on that map. Yep. yep. South of Egypt. And most Sub-Saharan Africans descend from Kush, that was known as a kingdom of dark-skinned people. Mitzrayim is the Hebrew word for Egypt, and so there's no question mark on that one. And Mitzrayim, is his descendants moved into Egypt after Babel and set up the Egyptian civilization there. 
Huts was the name for the Libyans. And this would be a North African people. They're no longer extant. North Africa has seen so many people migrate through. Uh, a lot of Putz descendants ended up getting pushed into the Saharan Desert after the Arab invasion and even after the Romans invaded. And so some of the uh, rest of tribe of tribal people in the middle of the Sahara Desert may be descended from him today. And the Kaftarites were the people that settled on Crete. And that was just originally. Crete got devastated by a tsunami post-flood and was largely destroyed. The ancient Minoan civilization would have been the Kaftarites. And that was a very well-established, well-developed civilization that got obliterated in a single day by a tsunami that was 120 or 200 feet. It was a volcanic eruption to the north of them triggered a massive wave. It's possible that Atlantis derives from that civilizational crash, but it's hard to say. Nobody knows where Plato's actual source was. He says he heard the story in Greece or in Egypt, but there's nothing in Egyptian stories that would point to it being the predecessor for that story. One of the descendants of Kush is a guy by the name of Nimrod. And his name means let us rebel, which has led many people to think that he might be connected with the rebellion at Babel. If you remember, post-flood people are still living several hundred years, and so it's quite likely that a whole lot of generations were piled up and alive all at the same time. And um, his name actually gets preserved in the Babylonian god Marduk. The N-I is a prefix in Hebrew, and the key root of his name is the M-R-D consonants, which you can see in Marduk. And he pops up regularly in Babylonian lore and myth. And he was clearly a king in Mesopotamia, as he is described, because the centers of his kingdom were Nineveh, Babylon, Uruk, and another place. And those are extant geographical locations today that you can find, and they do a lot of archaeology in those locations. So Ham's genealogy is probably the hardest one to make sense of because he had so many descendants that were listed. But if you look at that closely enough, long enough, you should be able to make sense of it. I'll go ahead and hand out the genealogy of Shem's descendants. Shem's descendants, if you look at the map, largely stayed in the Middle East and didn't move out too many places. So you're going to find them in the Arabian Peninsula and in Mesopotamia. They didn't move north, east, or west. And they did not head particularly far south and into Africa or anything. So Elam was a kingdom that is now in modern day Iran. Asher is the forefather of the Assyrians. That becomes a major empire in the ancient world, and we'll come across them quite a few more times in the Old Testament here. Our Faxad is equivalent to the Chaldeans, which is also more commonly known as the Babylonians. If you remember, Abram was, or came out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and that was a coastal city at the time. Interestingly enough, Ur is no longer on the coast of the Persian Gulf, but when Abram lived there, it was. And um, the Chaldeans become the Babylonians. Lud is one of the exceptions in the immigration. He moved into Asia Minor, otherwise known as Turkey, and the empire of the Lydians descended from Lud. 
The Lydians are famous for being the first kingdom to make coined money. And they were defeated by Cyrus the Great in a very ingenious military campaign about 1,500 years after the Tower of Babel. Aram is the Aramians. They settled in the northern part of Mesopotamia, not too far away from Babel, actually. And Joktan became the father of the Arabs. Oftentimes people think that the Arabs descend from Ishmael, but they actually trace their genealogy back to Joktan, who is the brother of Peleg, Ishmael being descended from Peleg through Abraham. And he had 13 sons. I believe one of his sons is named Hazar Mabath. Does that look right? Yes, yeah. number three. And the only reason I bring that your attention to that guy's name is his name means the city of death, which just means there's a story there. Either he brought death to a city or he was born when a city got wiped out by something or other, but his name means the city of death. Yeah. Mavath, you come across a few other times in the Old Testament. One of David's mighty men was named Osmaveth. His name means the hand of death. You would love to have one of your bodyguard soldiers equipped with a sword, and his name is the hand of death. All right. So this is the map we looked at earlier here. And I probably don't actually need to have it in there. But the next place we're going to here, actually, shifting gears just a little bit, I'm going to point out something that I first was, my attention was first brought to in an archaeological history class I was taking. So Tower of Babel is a very notable tower. There's this archaeological phenomena of tower building that took place, and this is really fun because... The standard theory says that the whole earth was settled by hunter-gatherers and they just didn't descend very directly from each other and then simultaneously they all get the idea to build a tower in the same shape, in the same form, for the same reasons. And they can't explain why that would be. They have no idea why somebody in Mexico would come up with the idea of building a pyramid structure tower at the same time the Egyptians do and the same time the Sumerians are doing that. They look very and they look very similar, which you're going to see here. So this is the ziggurat at Ur that's been rebuilt. This is where Abram came from. It used to be on the seashore of the Persian Gulf, but the rivers have sedimented in enough that it is no longer on the seashore. Wait, they rebuilt it? Yes, that has been rebuilt because you can turn it into a really cool... Um, oh, pay to get in. Yep. Yeah, Tourist trap oh. if you rebuild it. Wait, so is that Why the original foundation then? I'm sorry, what? Is that the original foundation? Yeah. Why? At the top, you can see it's still not fully rebuilt, but... They figured out what shape it was, and that's what the ziggurat looked like. And a lot of people figure that the Tower of Babel probably was pretty close in shape and form to a ziggurat, which is not a bad idea, but it could have been a little different, and they didn't finish it, so we don't know what they actually intended it to look like. Um, but you'll notice that that's roughly similar to what the pyramids end up looking like. And the Egyptians built pyramids as soon as they had a population density to justify it, which was pretty quick. And... Um, the best pyramids were the first ones built, and then they got lower in quality thereafter. And that's an interesting thing. They brought that ability with them. But this is not the only place they also replicated that. In China, and this is a good deal later actually, but there's a mausoleum, this was an earthen pyramid. It's a little shorter than it used to be. There is an emperor buried in the bottom of that, and they recreated his kingdom, including all the rivers and lakes which they had um, in using mercury, actually. And they've done some drilling and discovered the mercury concentration levels at the bottom of that are particularly high. The Chinese have not just, uh, proceeded with uh, digging it up because they don't think they have the technology to preserve it well enough yet. But they're curious as to what's in the bottom of that. In England, you have another one here. This is another earthen mound. 
this one is in Central America. These are the Olmecs, were the first major civilization in Central America. And they're an interesting thing because it was hunter-gatherers that moved across the Bering Strait and got into the Americas and settled. And when they got into Central America, they reinvented agriculture using corn. That didn't come over um, from the old world. And then they got down to business and started building pyramids in short order. And the biggest ones in Mexico were the first ones built, the Olmecs, the Aztecs, and the Mayans copied it later, but they were just <coughs> smaller copies of the previous idea. So this is much, much smaller than what the Olmecs ended up building. And then in North America, we've got this one down by St. Louis. This is an earthen one. It's probably a little shorter than it was because of erosion. This is at Cahokia. It has a lot of dirt, but it's interesting. This is just a small sampling of all the towers, mounds, pyramids, and everything else that were built across the earth. This is an architectural form that goes back to the Tower of Babel and points towards that uh, as being the original inspiration. Now, the other thing I want to look at here tonight are the language families of the earth because this all originates at Babel which is why the memory verse for the week was out of Revelation, because every tribe, nation, and language is represented in heaven. And there were not massive numbers of languages until God scattered the people by confusing their languages. Now, a language family is pretty easy to trace because you end up with really similar words amongst a whole bunch of languages. And so this illustrates the Indo-European family of languages. And in the Indo-European family of languages, you've got Germanic, you've got the Romance languages like Latin, Spanish, French. You've got the Nordic languages, I believe, Celtic, and also some languages that landed in India and Iran are also from the same language family. And this would point to a migration out of Central Asia into both Europe and also down into India. And they have traced that genetically and linguistically. And they all seem to descend from one common language that was probably created at Babel. And the idea of language families today is that language probably should have only evolved once and so all the languages should evolve back to some common tongue, but they don't find that at all. And so what actually is represented in the world families of languages is more of a forest of a whole bunch of related languages that are not actually related to each other at all. So just like in a forest in the woods, you can come across oak trees and maple trees, and they all have branches and trunks and leaves and everything like that. One tree is not connected to another tree, though. They're all independent. And in the um, language forest, there's about 130 different families of languages. Some of them have lots and lots of descendants, and some of them haven't fared as well because of imperialism and immigration patterns and such. And so there's only a few extant representatives today. Papua New Guinea has a diverse number of languages, and there's a huge number of variety in there. Um, but in any case, this too points towards Babel because it's impossible to think that language would have simultaneously um, evolved in the human race 130 times to create the 130 language families that exist. Another one I'll point out to you is the ancient Sumerian tongue. And this is a unique one to me because it is the oldest written language known on the earth, but it is completely isolated from every single language family in the world. The Sumerians were, of course, the people that lived between the Tigris and the Euphrates River in the neighborhood of Babel. And they have a language that doesn't seem to be related to any other language spoken, even though they were the first civilization. What do you suppose happened to the ancient Sumerian? What if their languages got mixed up and 
nobody ended up speaking it anymore. Yep. There were some dis um, people that understood it as a dead language. The Assyrians maintained the memory of it. And Akkadian is the only other language that might possibly be related to it, but that one is not that similar to it from what I read. I don't speak either one of them, so I don't know. But uh, there's a lot of what I would say is circumstantial evidence that would point to Sumerian being the language that came through the flood on the ark and that all the people were speaking when they were trying to build the Tower of Babel and then they got scattered and changed all their languages and they went forth into the world. And interestingly enough, you can see the family groups through the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth as they went forth and languages and families seem to go together. And eventually through lots of complex periods of migration, you end up with the world today. Anybody have any questions on Babel, the language families, all those things? All right. Well, next week, it will feel like we're shifting gears. We're going to accelerate through the book of Genesis. We're going to shift into the patriarch era. We'll look at both Abraham and Isaac next week. We'll start speeding up our survey of the Old Testament.